happens in pregnancy, usually after 20 weeks of gestation, where a mother develops hypertension together with problems in organs like the kidneys, liver, brain, or the placenta. It can also happen after birth, postpartum. If it worsens and the mother starts to have seizures, the condition is called eclampsia. The only true cure for preeclampsia is delivery of the baby and placenta, but careful treatment can control it until delivery is safe. What causes preeclampsia? The exact cause is not fully understood, but the main problem starts with the placenta. The blood vessels in the placenta do not develop normally. This leads to narrow vessels, poor blood flow, and high pressure in the mother's circulation. The mother's blood vessels become irritated and leaky, leading to swelling and less blood reaching vital organs. What are the risk factors for preeclampsia? Primigravita, first pregnancy. Previous preeclampsia in an earlier pregnancy. Family history of preeclampsia. Multiple pregnancies such as twins or triplets. Advanced maternal age, over 40 years. Adolescent pregnancy. Obesity. Medical problems like chronic hypertension, diabetes mellitus, renal disease, systemic lupus, erythematosus, SLE, or clotting disorders. In vitro fertilization, IVF. What are the clinical features of preeclampsia? For the mother, hypertension, 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury or more, severe if 160 over 110 millimeters of mercury or more. Edema, swelling of the face, hands, and sometimes legs. Headache that does not go away with simple treatment. Visual problems, blurred vision, flashing lights, or temporary loss of sight. Epigastric pain or pain in the right upper abdomen under the ribs, liver area. Nausea and vomiting in late pregnancy. Hyperreflexia, reflexes stronger than normal, sometimes with clonus. For the baby, intrauterine growth restriction, IUGR. Abnormal fetal heart rate or distress. Placental abruption in severe cases. Stillbirth if very severe. Complications of preeclampsia. For the mother, eclampsia, seizures. Help syndrome. Hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelets. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, liver rupture or severe liver damage. Acute kidney injury or kidney failure. Maternal death if untreated. For the baby, preterm birth. Intrauterine growth restriction, IUGR. Fetal distress, stillbirth in severe cases. How is preeclampsia assessed or diagnosed? Blood pressure monitoring, repeated checks, not just once. Urine tests for protein, still useful though no longer essential for diagnosis. Blood tests, platelet count may be low. Liver function tests, LFTs. Enzymes may rise. Renal function, creatinine and urea may rise. What monitoring is needed in preeclampsia? Urine output, measured closely to detect kidney involvement. Maternal symptoms, headache, vision changes, abdominal pain. Fetal monitoring, ultrasound for growth, fetal heart rate monitoring. Maternal counting of fetal movements, kick chart. Treatment for preeclampsia. General measures, rest, preferably lying on the left side to improve utero-placental blood flow. Regular monitoring of blood pressure, urine, and baby's growth. Hospital admission if the condition is moderate or severe. Medications. Antihypertensives, such as labetalol, nifedipine, or hydrolyzine to lower blood pressure. Magnesium sulfate, given to prevent or treat seizures. The mother is checked for reflexes, breathing, and urine output to detect signs of magnesium toxicity. Calcium gluconate is kept ready as an antidote for magnesium sulfate toxicity. Delivery. Delivery is the only cure. If the pregnancy is at 37 weeks or more, delivery is usually planned. If earlier than 37 weeks but the disease is severe, delivery may still be required. The decision depends on the mother's condition and the baby's well-being. Postpartum care for preeclampsia. Preeclampsia can continue or even start after birth, postpartum, up to six weeks. 
Blood pressure should be monitored closely after delivery. Antihypertensives that are safe for breastfeeding are given if needed. Magnesium sulfate may continue for 24 to 48 hours after birth if the mother had severe preeclampsia or eclampsia. Mothers should be advised about warning symptoms such as headache, blurred vision, swelling, or breathing difficulty. For more health academic information, visit www.medocio.com. Healthcare Ideas That Connect. In this lesson, we will look at health assessment, the foundation of all clinical care. What is health assessment? Health assessment is an interactive process in which the healthcare provider gathers information from the client through history taking and examinations. This is the foundation of all clinical decision making. Quality assessment aims to identify the client's problems and strengths. Healthcare providers achieve this through a systematic process of collecting subjective and objective data. What are subjective and objective data? Subjective data are what the client tells you, like, I have a pounding headache. Objective data are what you observe, for example, a swollen arm or high body temperature. Remember this tip. You observe objective data while the subject, client, provides subjective data. Why is assessment important? Health assessment is vital because it enables the healthcare provider to 1. Identify client problems and strengths. 2. Identify health promotion and disease prevention opportunities. 3. Generate an accurate and evidence-based diagnosis. 4. Guide the development of effective care plans. 5. Evaluate outcomes to improve future care. A good assessment should respect cultural and spiritual values because health is not just physical. Beliefs, traditions, identity, and meaning shape it. When healthcare providers acknowledge and integrate these dimensions, they move beyond symptom checking to truly understand the client behind the illness. This enhances trust and communication and ensures that care is respectful, client-centered, and holistic. Ignoring the cultural and spiritual dimensions can erode trust and impair compliance with care. For example, failure to understand fasting during Ramadan or beliefs about end-of-life care may lead to ethical conflicts. Health assessment has two major components. 1. Health history, a detailed conversation exploring past and current health conditions. 2. Physical examination, a systematic evaluation of the body using inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. These components work together to build a complete clinical profile of the client. Health history is a conversation about a client's past and present health, including their illnesses, lifestyle, and family history. It helps healthcare providers better understand the client and plan the right care. The health history includes the following. Biographical data, chief complaint, history of present illness, past medical history, family history, social and client history, review of systems. Each piece builds a clearer picture of the client's health status. Let us explore the various aspects of health history. Biographical data provide basic identifying information about the client. It includes details such as name, age, sex, date of birth, marital status, occupation, contact information, and sometimes ethnicity or language spoken. This information is essential for proper identification, record keeping, communication, and understanding the client's social context. It also forms the starting point of any health assessment, ensuring that care is directed to the right client in a culturally and contextually appropriate manner. The chief complaint is the client's description of the primary reason for seeking medical care. It is documented in their own words and reflects their main concerns or symptoms. Example, I feel dizzy and my chest hurts. Quotation marks should always be used to capture it exactly. The history of the present illness helps to understand how the client's current problem started, how it has changed, and what makes it better or worse. It builds on the chief complaint by asking detailed questions regarding it. This is done using the seven attributes of a symptom. The seven attributes of a symptom are as follows. 1. Location. Identify exactly where the client feels the symptom. 2. Quality. Ask the client to describe what the symptom feels like. For example, sharp, dull, or burning. 3. Severity. Assess how intense the symptom is, often using a scale of 0 to 10. 4. Timing. Determine when the symptom started and how long it lasted. 
5. Setting. Understand the situation or activity the client was in when the symptom began. 6. Aggravating or relieving factors. Explore what makes the symptom worse or better. 7. Associated manifestations. Any other symptoms that occur with the main complaint. The past medical history covers health problems, treatments, and illnesses from the past that affect the client's current health. This includes chronic conditions, surgeries and hospitalizations, childhood illnesses, allergies, immunization status, past treatments or injuries. Family history provides insight into hereditary and genetic risks. It helps identify trends or conditions that run in the family, such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, mental health disorders. This information supports the development of preventive strategies and early interventions. Ask about immediate and extended relatives. Social history reveal how a client's environment and lifestyle impact their health. This includes living conditions, occupational stress, habits like smoking or alcohol use, exercise and diet, spirituality and sexual health when relevant. Understanding these factors helps in tailoring interventions to real-world contexts. The review of systems is a structured head-to-toe inquiry into each body system. It may uncover symptoms that the client has not yet mentioned. The systems review typically include the following. General well-being, skin, hair, nails, respiratory and cardiac, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, neurological and endocrine. The review of systems ensures a thorough assessment that leaves no area unassessed. Myasthenia gravis. Imagine trying to walk, but the muscles feel weak and tired even though the client hasn't been doing much. Myasthenia gravis, a neuromuscular disorder where the muscles, which help in movement, become weaker and tire out faster than usual. What is myasthenia gravis? Myasthenia gravis occurs because of a problem at the neuromuscular junction, the point where nerves connect to muscles. Normally, when a nerve sends a signal, a chemical called acetylcholine is released, which helps muscles contract and move. But in myasthenia gravis, the body's immune system produces antibodies that attack acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction, preventing acetylcholine from doing its job properly. As a result, muscles don't get the signals they need causing weakness and fatigue. The client might feel it in the eyelids, the arms, or even when breathing. Symptoms of myasthenia gravis. The symptoms of myasthenia gravis can vary, but here are the most common ones. The client may notice their eyelids drooping, also known as ptosis, or have double vision, diplopia. These are some of the earliest signs of muscle weakness. Many clients with myasthenia gravis experience difficulty chewing and swallowing a condition known as dysphagia. A weak or hoarse voice is also common. In severe cases, breathing can become difficult as the muscles used for respiration may be affected. Clients with myasthenia gravis may also have difficulty making facial expressions like smiling or frowning. Muscle weakness can affect both the arms and legs, making it difficult to lift objects or stand up for long periods. Fatigue is common and muscles often weaken with repetitive use, making tasks like climbing stairs or walking long distances exhausting. Myasthenic crisis versus cholinergic crisis. In some cases, myasthenia gravis can lead to crises, emergency situations where the condition becomes life-threatening. Let's look at two types of crises, myasthenic crisis and cholinergic crisis. Myasthenic crisis. A myasthenic crisis happens when the body isn't getting enough acetylcholine. This can be triggered by things like stress, infection, or not taking enough medication. It leads to severe muscle weakness, especially in the muscles that control breathing. Respiratory failure can occur. To treat this crisis, more anticholinesterase medication is given to help boost acetylcholine levels. Cholinergic crisis. On the other hand, a cholinergic crisis happens when there's too much acetylcholine. This can occur if the client takes too much of their medication. This leads to symptoms like abdominal cramps, diarrhea, blurry vision, and excessive sweating. To treat a cholinergic crisis, the medication is stopped and atropine sulfate is given to reverse the effects of too much acetylcholine. Edrophonium or Tensilon test. 
The Tensilon test is performed by a neurologist to diagnose myasthenia gravis and differentiate between a myasthenic crisis and a cholinergic crisis. The Tensilon test involves giving edrophonium, a drug that temporarily boosts acetylcholine activity. If the client's muscle strength improves after receiving the drug, it suggests myasthenia gravis. To differentiate between the types of crisis, in a myasthenic crisis, muscle strength improves after edrophonium administration, indicating the need for increased cholinesterase inhibitor dosage. In a cholinergic crisis, muscle weakness worsens after edrophonium administration, indicating overmedication. Let me ask a quick question before we continue. What would you expect to happen to the client's muscles if they have myasthenia gravis after receiving edrophonium? Atropine sulfate use in Tensilon test. While edrophonium helps determine if the client has myasthenia gravis or is in crisis, it can also cause side effects, like bradycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and cardiac arrest. To counteract this, atropine sulfate is always kept on hand during the test. Atropine sulfate is an anticholinergic that works by blocking the effects of acetylcholine on the heart, preventing bradycardia and other adverse cardiac events to keep the client safe during the test. Treatment and Management of Myasthenia Gravis Managing myasthenia gravis requires a combination of treatments. The main approach is using medications like anticholinesterase drugs to boost acetylcholine levels. However, certain medications like fluoroquinolones and beta blockers can make myasthenia gravis worse and should be avoided. Clients should also wear a Medic Alert bracelet. Avoid stress and infections and ensure they're getting enough rest to prevent fatigue. Key takeaways. To wrap it up, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune condition that affects acetylcholine receptors, causing muscle weakness. Thanks for watching and stay informed. If you found this helpful, like, share, and subscribe. For more medical academic insights, register on www.medocio.com, the number one medical e-learning and social platform.